Hello uh, YouTube enthusiasts, Richard Lewis here, you will notice again, not in my usual surroundings, I'm currently in a hotel room in Serbia, uh, where I'll be doing the World Championships for CSGO, uh, but I've been meaning to put a video out about this for a while, and a lot of people have been asking me when it's coming, so I've got a bit of time this morning before we go over to start rehearsals, so I thought I may as well record it now. So. Uh, as you'll see by the title, this video is about the team union uh, that's formed. And of course, we should make quotation marks in the air, although doing that does make you a bit of a cunt, actually. Uh, because it's not really a union. But we'll get into that uh, in a little bit. Let's talk about the bare bones of the story first and foremost. So, <clears throat> I came into possession uh, of an email that had been circulating. It had been sent to all the major tournament organisers, ESL, DreamHack... Star Ladder Face It, PGL, MLG, Sevo, Join Dota, Dota Cinema, One Game Agency uh, that own Dota Pit and Counter Pit, ESEA, ESWC, Dreams Media, BTS, Frag by and Gfinity. And it was written by the CEO of Na'Vi, uh, better known as um, Zero Gravity. Now this email uh, was basically outlining a series of demands and criteria for the top tier teams uh, in this association, in this group, uh, that needed to be met uh, in order for them to attend. Now again, just to be clear, this group included Na'Vi, Team Liquid, CLG, Cloud9, Virtus Pro, TSM, Fnatic, Ninjas in Pyjamas, Titan, and Envious. And you will of course notice immediately that these are the same names we see invited to all the big meetings and all of the uh, big announcements seem to involve one or more of these organizations. Uh, it's been a pretty poorly kept secret that this group has kind of bandied together to collectively bargain in the past. In fact, uh, I think recently they uh, did this with Gfinity, uh, where it was over um, travel arrangements and travel costs, and Gfinity ended up having to not only pay more than they would have liked for travel expenses, but increase their prize pool as well. And this was kind of kept a little bit quiet. So this 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 group of people have been operating for a while. This is the first time they've really made their existence known. The first time they've really formalized their demands so the first thing we need to say is is this a good or a bad thing this is the debate uh and of course there isn't an easy answer to this there isn't a yes or a no there isn't a good or a bad to it there's there's both there's good and bad now uh, what i'll do is i'll i'll start by talking about the good now for the longest period of time uh, I think tournament organizers actually have had the rule of the roost within esports. Certainly, that's been my experience. Tournament organizers have ran events, uh, you know, acquired viewing numbers from the teams that attend, from the fans of those teams. And yet, more often than not, when you see the reality of how those tournaments pan out in terms of like. How soon do the uh, organizations get their prize money? How soon do they get their travel expenses? How well are they actually looked after at the event? It's pretty slipshod. Uh, it's not particularly great. Uh, you can remember ESL back in sort of a past life, and it doesn't actually bear any resemblance to the current ESL, but they were notorious for this. Uh, teams that attended IEM, used to, uh, for example, used to have to wait quite a long time to get their prize money, and while this was always outwardly projected as being paperwork issues or whatever, it simply came down to poor management of cash flow and not prioritizing uh, prize money over other things. Indeed, for online competitions, very often people were told you can't have your prize money because we're using that money for other things right now within the business, sometimes not even related to the game. So these things are terrible. These things should never happen. When you consider there's still people out there that are owed money from the CPL, it's and they're never going to get it, obviously. Uh, the you can you can say immediately that the tournament organisers have uh, had a very kind of unfair leverage uh, on the industry. After all, if an organisation runs on sponsor money, you need a platform to display those sponsors. The tournaments are that platform. 
So they're kind of beholden to the tournament organizers. They have to go, and they have they have to do it to meet their sponsor obligations. Otherwise, if you never played in the tournament, if if you boycott every tournament organizer that wasn't paying prize money, you wouldn't be able to attract as big sponsors. This actually was proven back in the days when the G7, another elite banding of uh, top tier teams, which was actually fucking useless and very little more than a dick measuring contest. They tried to organize a boycott, I believe, of ES. WC based on the fact that they were their events were poor they hadn't paid out prize money yet when that event sort of changed hands and even though they said hey we're going to totally pay all that outstanding prize money even though it's not our obligation to do so the G7 folded they couldn't even hold out for one event uh, and that should tell you exactly the sort of leverage that tournament organizers have uh, in this uh, ecosystem so I think anything that puts the onus on tournament organizers Ensuring they pay out prize money on time, that they run good events. I think that's a good thing. And I definitely think it's something they need to think about. Uh, also, in terms of the, the, the uh, these group uh, of team organizations, they are lobbying for improvements for the players. Which, on the surface, seems decent of them. Uh, but, of course, as we now know, no player was consulted about this. No team owner went and spoke to a player and said, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to lobby for? How can we improve uh, your situation? That didn't happen at any point in the process. So we get into this situation where can a team owner truly speak for what a player wants without even having a conversation with them? I would say no. So uh, that's problematic. But anyway, it is still good that what they're doing is they're making tournament organizers aware of player conditions. And this is a big big problem in the industry actually that uh, I've even seen it happen this way before and again obviously I won't name names but um, where a, a tournament has had a pretty awful environment for players players have gone, they've stayed in bad hotels they haven't had travel, they haven't had a decent standard of food if any uh, their conditions uh, don't keep them secure from the crowds, from the fans. There isn't a, a area for them to relax or to practice. Uh, the stages, the soundproofing doesn't work. You know, all of these things contribute towards a player having a bad experience. And when players have complained about that experience, the organizations that those players play for have gone to the tournament organizers and been like, our players aren't happy. And they've just said, yeah, 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 but you know, we'll, we've got some other things coming up. We can invite you to those things if you want. We can include you in those things, <laughs> but uh, you've got to make this whole player complaint thing go away or certainly at least not endorse it or try and be diplomatic and diffuse the situation. So very often, tournament organizers who have to think about sponsors ahead of players that's just the nature of the business that's why we need a player advocacy group uh they aren't you know challenging the tournament organizers so this is this is a, a step in the right direction at least they are saying we will not attend unless this criteria is met so on the surface of it it's good equally as well i think having anything that encourages communication and partnership between team organi uh, team organizations between the teams that's a good thing as well because very often it's cutthroat very much uh, ruthless you will find if one team drops out of a tournament the other one's there to really jump in they they're very often battling for the same sponsors this it makes the industry a horrible place and it, it actually means that like one or two mistakes one or two unfortunate situations and the people that are kind of your peers and equals in the scene they will capitalize it can make it a very stressful environment to work in if you enter into the spirit of cooperation and you're having regular communications and you understand that together you present a much stronger partnership than you do if you're all trying to fuck each other over individually i think that's a good thing as well but ultimately a lot of these things are very abstract these are uh, concepts that aren't going to necessarily have a direct and tangible impact on improving uh, the scene except maybe with the prize money thing so uh, I, I've got, got to point out that there's a lot of bad things about this um, and it's just got the potential to really harm the ecosystem if we don't add a few other um, checks and balances so the first thing I will d refer to is that this uh, organization, this, this union, this association, whatever you want to call it this group effectively 
Um, it, it's it's not taking into account uh, what these demands will do in terms of the overall ecosystem. So by saying we will not attend an international event unless it has $75,000 worth of prize money, okay, I mean, on the one hand, you might say, well, that'll push the prize money up, great. But what if it doesn't? What if all it means is actually that the the dream hacks even i mean that's how high up the food chain we're talking about a, a, a dream hack or a frag bite or a face it or a gfinity whoever it might be if they are if they can only put up say fifty thousand dollars in prize money and they're relying on having big teams attend so they can have viewer numbers so they can have sponsors attached to a projection on viewer numbers if they then don't attend what happens is you don't secure those sponsors, or if you've already secured them, they don't come back, or they reduce their investment. This, in turn, means you have to reduce the prize money, not raise it. What well, you're effectively asking these organizations that already can't hit $75,000 worth of prize money, you're asking them to take financial gambles. And when you start doing that, the whole health of the company can be put into jeopardy. Keep in mind that when we talk about esports tournament organizers, companies like DreamHack, companies like Gfinity, they are not just a group of people with a bank account. They are fully running companies that have employees at all levels. So when you start pushing, you know, putting pressure on that, all of a sudden, it's like, well, where do we need to make cutbacks? Do we do we cut out this game because it's no longer profitable? So. We're making demands for, to improve CSGO. CSGO represents a better return in terms of numbers than StarCraft or fighting games. Do those guys get get cut? Is there no tournament? Does that prize money get put into another game? Do, do all the staff associated with running that tournament, do they all get fired? Do they have a job? And the reality is, chances are, that if these companies do want to stay and ride the Dota 2 and the CSGO train, the two sort of you know successful esports at the moment, CSGO growing way far and above uh, and beyond expectations then the answer is yeah you're gonna have to make cuts somewhere it's either that or you go out and you, you get more investors and then all of a sudden this is a very unreliable revenue stream we're talking about here now i imagine that an organization the size of dreamhack uh, will be fine, uh, but I have no idea about their business model and how finely tuned and carefully balanced it is. I couldn't give you the minutiae on that. I couldn't explain it. So if that, let's just say, for example, and we know this is true, MTG, a very rich and wealthy sugar daddy who've already bought ESCA, who've already bought a 74% controlling share of ESL, they want to buy, I believe it's a 66% controlling share of DreamHack, already have an established relationship with DreamHack, pay something like 1 million euros annually to have that studio partnership that they did with dreamhack now let's just say if dreamhack aren't able to increase this money doesn't that put more pressure on them to to maybe sell to mtg and we don't necessarily want esl and dreamhack owned by one parent company now we start getting with esea along with that we now start moving into monopoly territory so actually this collective bargaining is all of a sudden creating two things it's it's creating an impetus to maybe sell, to get higher levels of investment, and it also could be forcing some of the smaller companies to, to go under, to fold, to no longer run tournaments. And as I said, when, when you consider, when I'm talking about small companies, as people like Fragbike, people like Face It, I mean, that's that that's the, the impact of this. So that's a bad thing. On top of that, uh, I think it's uh, worth mentioning that uh, these organizations that have come together, there are several other top tier premier organizations that want to be involved in that group. And they're telling them to oh, fuck off. They're saying you can't come and sit at this table. And this is true. So this hasn't been spoken about, but there's a there's a reason why it's the select few. And it's not other organizations. It's not second tier organizations. There is a hierarchy, which you can argue is fine and fair, but that hierarchy isn't necessarily predicated on success, turnover, you know, all of these other metrics by which you would measure a successful gaming organization, it's actually uh, being 
kind of predicated just on personal relationships between team owners. What arguments have they had in the past? How seriously do they consider these people? There's a snobbishness involved in it. So the idea that this is a, a team association that's going to benefit everybody, we can dispel that myth right now. It's an association that dispels a very uh, elite few and not even organizations that you would consider elite level. Let's just say, for example, if it was all the teams that were in ESL and the ESEA Pro League, all of a sudden I might have a little bit more, okay, well, it, it seems to be open to everybody that matters, but it isn't. Some of those organizations in that league have made approaches and been like, hey, can we join the party? And they're being told, get fucked. You're not even, we're not even interested in representing you. We've got our little clique. So people should be afraid and nervous about that. Then on top of that, you've got this advocating for players without speaking of players. Now, I've interviewed a bunch of players privately, off the record, obviously been, um, you know, speaking to, to lots of them about the, the team, uh, the, sorry, the player union thing I'm, I'm trying to get going, which now seems to be more vitally important than it ever was with a team association mm -hmm. in place. And not one of them has actually uh, been consulted about this. So this list of demands that the team owners are saying our players absolutely must have, well, they know nothing about it. And you might think, yeah, but come on, Richard, there's some common sense here. It's all common sense stuff. No player is going to say, I don't want that. Fine. But let's look at this. So if they're only attending of international events of $75,000, or $100,000 for Dota, or if it's NA only, $30,000 or less. Now, keep in mind, they're demanding for all expenses to be covered. All expenses. Travel, to and from the hotels, and camp fares. This should be a zero-cost operation. So why would you say to your players, you can't attend that event over there? Because these players have their income supplemented by prize money. So even if you're playing in a small tournament like one where the top prize is $15,000. Presuming the organization takes a 0% cut, that's an extra $3,000 per player. And if the organization does take a cut, typically a cut is anything between 10 and 25%, depending on the organization. Usually it's on a sliding scale, so the bigger the amount, the bigger the cut. It's simply not worth it for the organization. It represents such a small amount of money. Now, that isn't how you should be advocating for your players, because it's a lot for players. And this is where it gets even more complex. Some players have signed contracts on, on the basis of, we, we, we will take a smaller salary if we get a higher cut of the prize money. When our organizations are saying, you can't go to these tournaments anymore. So they, they've lost twice. So any contract that was negotiated on that basis, now with the arrival of this uh, team union, team association, whatever you want to call it, they need to be renegotiated, in my opinion, because the the owners must have known they were going to do this. The owners must have known they were going to put these demands forward. I imagine they haven't just put these out of thin air. So, again, players seem to be getting fucked over in this deal. That's why I think it's incredibly dangerous that these owners have just gone and negotiated things for players. Especially, look, I'm seeing contracts that... They're not getting more and more open. They're not benefiting players more and more. They're actually harming players more and more. People are looking to control image rights. People are looking to lock players in. People, people's salaries aren't necessarily a reflection of the kind of sponsorship deals that they're signing. So all of this is a very dangerous climate for players overall. Now, speaking to that point, um, I did notice that uh, Bryce Blum, who is, uh, of course... Uh, with Unicorn, but principally made his name as uh, the esports uh, lawyer, the esports attorney. He uh, wrote an article from my old stomping ground, The Daily Dot, saying that he feels this team union will push the industry forward. And um, he talks about how it isn't really a union, uh, it's more about um, collective bargaining. And uh, this is a, a field that he's very experienced in. He's wrote a white paper about it when we've done shows together. Uh, I've referenced this white paper. It's very important. It's a very important read, and it's very relevant to our industry as it stands. But he doesn't seem to recognise um, that the that the, there is a kind of overarching problem that this isn't necessarily going to just imp improve the ecosystem. We're already talking about how it could potentially see some tournament uh, or, or organizers go under or stop doing tournaments and focus on other things. And he says that that might be good because tournament oversaturation is a huge issue. Now, I agree. Tournament oversaturation 
it is a big problem. We've already seen it basically suck the life out of multiple esports down the years. StarCraft Two definitely comes to mind uh, with that. I mean, it was it was so ridiculous because every weekend you were watching two or three tournaments all with insane production value and insane level players playing at it, and it was just too much. By the time WCS came along, you know the goose was already cooked. We're entering into this third and final expansion pack. Pretty much everybody assuming that, yeah, it'll give it a, a short, sharp boost in numbers for a few months, and then it's back to, you know, the old dead game meme. So, it is uh, it is a problem. It's definitely a problem, tournament oversaturation. But, that said, you don't resolve the issue of tournament saturation by effectively forcing companies out of business. That's all well and good uh, in the short term. Long term, that could be disastrous. You know, these big companies could get bought by anyone. They might decide not to support the game at all moving forward. Small tournaments are pretty much the lifeblood of any esports scene. They'll, they'll always be there because they're so small. They, they, they are, and they're geared around making their returns in other areas of the business or making small returns because they have a small team then you can always rely on them to be there. Equally, if they go out of business, where are the Tier 2 teams going to play? Where are the up-and-coming teams going to play? How is anybody going to get themselves on a platform where they can showcase their talents against top-tier teams and maybe get picked up by a top-tier organization themselves? This feels like the end of 1.6 that we're trying to shoehorn ourselves into without going through... 10 years of history prior to it. What we're doing is we're trying to get to a stage where we've just got elite level uh, organizations and elite level teams playing against each other in a very small circuit. And any anything outside of that is an outlier that doesn't deserve to be salaried, doesn't deserve to have an opportunity to prove itself. Can't get to a tournament where any of the top tier teams are because they're not going to be invited simply. So that's problematic. There's, the smaller tournaments are hugely important in that context. What was always great about a thing like the Frag Bite was, yeah, you know, you would get like an Envious or a, or a Titan or a Fnatic or, or an NIP, but you would also get a bunch of other teams you hadn't heard of, and maybe they get to the land stage and they impress a bunch of people. Well, with this sort of impacting on the ecosystem the way it is, we can probably kiss goodbye to that in the next 18 months because they're not going to be able to afford to continue. How does that help? CSGO, I don't see it, I don't understand it. So it seems that there's lots that people aren't necessarily taking into consideration. And I'll be honest, a lot of people that are talking about this in a positive light, they're the people who haven't been here very long, frankly. They're the people who haven't seen these kind of, you know, groups come together in the past, which someone like myself, I've seen many times over. And I can't think of one time where a powerful group of people within esports has come together and it's gone on to better esports. It's gone on to better them. <laughs> it's definitely gone on to better them. It's gone on to better their bank balances. And usually in the short term, actually, not even long term. Everyone has to come back into the sort of the the, the main group again. It, you have to come back to gen pop. It's like being in prison, you know? It, it, you've got to come back to mingle with the rest of us because the money runs out. I've seen that multiple times. You know, think about the CGS organizations. They were considered the elite level teams, the elite level managers. You know, they, everybody was like, yeah, where are they now? They've either left esports altogether or they're still grubbing away, trying to, you know, fucking have some positive impact. So, already talked about the G7 and what they achieved. Couldn't even organize a fucking boycott. What positive impact did they have on the industry apart from the continual dick stroke of being able to say that we were an elite level team? Look, if we weren't, why would we be surrounded by all these other elite level teams? It was pathetic. Uh, they never achieved anything positive, not that I can remember. And again, if anyone can think of it or find it, please show me. So, these groups like these coming together. It can be positive, but it's got to be done the right way, and it's got to be done with a sensitivity to understand the, the, the bigger picture. When we use the word ecosystem, it's so wonderfully specific and accurate to esports because it is so finely in balance that if one group has too much power, it can have these seismic impacts across the whole of the industry that people can end up completely fucked, and, and, and there's just no comeback from it. And we've seen it time and time again. What the esports bubble, it invariably bursts. So we've got to be careful. We're entering this new golden age. There's new levels of investment. There's new levels of opportunity. That's all excellent. But because of that, people are trying to mobilize to make sure they can get 
themselves and pretty much only themselves in a position to benefit from it in a way that no one else can. So that's all this group is really focused about. That's all this group really seems to be, yeah, that's its number one priority. So people need to be really mindful about supporting this or what positivity it can have on the industry. So I'm very skeptical. I feel a lot better about it when I think we've got like a player's association in place somebody to push back and protect the players i'll feel better about it once i know where the ownership of certain tournament organizers is going to go but right now this this is a move that i think it has it has the potential to be way more bad than good overall uh for the esports uh, business anyway so that's the video uh thanks a lot for watching uh i'm not going to be able to do a lot of shows while i'm out here in serbia the internet isn't great who knew uh, but um, I'm going to try and upload a video a day. I am sharing a room with Thorin, and uh, I, I um, he's recording all his videos in the same place. So we're kind of fighting for recording supremacy at the moment. But I will try and get one done daily while I'm out here. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next video.